بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد I begin with the hadith of Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reminds us إنما الأعمال بالنيات وإنما لكل امرئ ما نوى and in another hadith Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reminds us طلب العلم فريضة على كل مسلم The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that verily every action is based on the intention and whatever is one's intention will be the reward of that individual and in another hadith the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that seeking seeking fard ayn seeking the knowledge that is required is obligatory upon every Muslim we insha'Allah pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are able to enlighten ourselves with a little of that which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has taught to us. The chapter on fasting is generally a very lengthy chapter and the teachings of it can be very detailed but insha'Allah we will endeavor to go through just the necessary aspects of fasting in the brief time that we have today. We don't have a lot of time. If I wanted to do the workshop that I wanted to do, it would be at least double the time, but then none of you would show up. So that's why it's in three hours with a 15 minute break in between. And I hear that we have fresh fruits off of individuals, trees and samosas for snacks downstairs. So with all that said, insha'Allah, we will endeavor to begin. Uh, you should consider yourselves lucky in the sense that um, I've, worked on this, I've worked on this presentation uh, during the month of May, I believe, or was it April? I can't, it was in April. It was sometime in May. I delivered it for the first time in Houston. Um, can't remember anymore. June. June 15th and then I've delivered it at a few different places and around this time yesterday I was delivering this presentation in Detroit, Michigan and I just got home this morning. So, um, what, you know, all the, all the questions that I've received, the common questions, I've endeavored to incorporate those into uh, today's presentation. So, inshallah, we hope that um, we will have a good time together. That said, uh, if you are, if you're Indo-Pakistani and you like going to iftar parties, um, you should probably leave now because by the end of this presentation, iftar parties will be haram. Uh, so if you want to go to your iftar parties, you might as well leave. We won't give you bad looks either. We'll close our eyes for about two seconds. Yeah. Ramadan. You know, before we begin, we must understand that Ramadan is a time of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ramadan is a time of <clears throat> direct acts of worship. What we're doing right now, if we were to divide ibadah, ibadah can be divided into two. The direct act of worship of Allah and the indirect act of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What we, in, when we're reciting the Qur'an, when we're praying salah, when we're giving zakah, when we're performing hajj, these are all direct acts of worship. All that we're doing right now, these are considered indirect acts of worship. Right? This is not a direct act of worship. These are acts that are considered worship because they will strengthen our worship. But it's not a direct act of worship per se. And bear in mind, and this is the precedence that we need to set on the offset, that the month of Ramadan is specifically for the direct acts of worship. That is a precedence that we must set. The month of Ramadan is reserved for the direct acts of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and absolutely nothing else. Once we have that in mind, then we can go through the course, we can go through these slides, we can go through the presentation, understanding the importance of the actions that, we will, that we're required to do. And to what degree we should be doing them. I should also add that 
the method of spending Ramadan is not learned through workshops. Okay? The method of spending Ramadan is not learned through workshops. Workshops are just the beginning, just to sort of give you a little introductory session on how to spend Ramadan. We learn how to spend Ramadan by spending time with the awliya Allah, right? with the scholars, the ulama. That's how you will learn how to spend Ramadan. Right? That's, that's how it's taught. And by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, during the years when I was a student, um, which was not too long ago, um, I had the honor of spending a few Ramadans with individuals and you learned what Ramadan really meant. And then when you become non-social in Ramadan and people give you flack for it, it doesn't matter to you anymore. Right? Because the concept of Ramadan is Allah. Right? We need to invite Allah into our hearts. And we need to get invited to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the only invitation that matters. Now with that said, inshaAllah, we will move on. Uh, initially, we will go through some of the ayat that we find in the Qur'an in regards to Ramadan and fasting. Then we will go through some ahadith. Then we will go through some history, inshaAllah. And then um, we will briefly go through some fiqh of Ramadan. Now, a'udhu billahi min shaytan rajim bismillah rahman rahim يا أيها الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون أياما معدودات فمن كان منكم مريضا أو على سفر فعدة من أيام أخر وعلى الذين يطيقونه فدية طعام مسكين فمن تطوع خيرا فهو خير له وأن تصوم خير لكم إن كنتم تعلمون شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان فمن شهد منكم الشهر فليصم ومن كان مريضا أو على سفر فعدة من أيام أخر يريد الله بكم اليسر ولا يريد بكم العسر ولتكملوا العدة ولتكبروا الله على ما هداكم ولعلكم تشكرون صدق الله العظيم These are the verses of Surah Al-Baqarah in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us to fast. These are the verses of Surah Al-Baqarah through which we find the obligation of fasting and these are the verses of Surah Al-Baqarah that we find that all the stipulations of fasting um, go back to. And then of course after that we learn from the ahadith of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Very briefly, we don't have a lot of time, um, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says to the believing men and women, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O believing men and women, Kutiba alaykum as siyam. Siyam, fasting, has been made obligatory onto you. And then he reminds us, Kama kutiba ala ladheena min qablikum, as it already was obligatory upon the previous ummahs. So we're reminded that this is not something that is brand new. This is something that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala had prescribed for humanity. Right, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had prescribed for humanity and this continued from before the time of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In fact, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself fasted. Narrations mention that before the month, the fasting of the month of Ramadan became obligatory on the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet alayhi sallam fasted. And we find specifically in the hadith that after the Prophet alayhi sallam came to Medina Munawwara, he would fast on Ashura, the 10th of Muharram, and he would fast the three days every month, Ayyamul Bid. Right? The Prophet ﷺ fasted the three white days every month. Um, and then, of course, we learn from other ahadith that after the fasting of the month of Ramadan became obligatory, the Prophet ﷺ fasted on Mondays and Thursdays as well. And that's why, if you've attended any of my last few khutbahs, I, I've mentioned that when we talk about Islam to other people, we can actually advertise Islam by saying that we have a weight loss program because weight loss is a big thing these days, right? Uh, I was just listening to the radio. I wasn't listening to the radio. The guy next to my, my car was listening to the radio this morning and I heard the part that said, you know, Americans spend billions of dollars on exercising and weight loss every year. 
that's the part I caught before the light turned green. And um, I thought to myself, wow, you know, we have an amazing exercise, a weight loss program. If we were to fast three days every month, every Monday and Thursday, do the math, that's 11 days, right? We'd be fasting a third of the month um, and we wouldn't have fat Muslims. Um, there's nothing wrong with that, but you know what I'm saying. Um, uh, fasting has been made um, obligatory upon you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Why? Why is fasting obligatory? So that we acquire the consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ayyaman ma'dudat, certain specific days. Right, certain, and again, clarifying that prior to this, voluntary fasts were done whenever you wanted to do. But the obligatory fasts are ayyamam ma'dudat, a fixed number of days. And then the ayah goes on to mention, and we'll cover this in detail later, and we won't cover it now. Whosoever is ill amongst you or on a journey, fa'iddatum min ayyamin ukhar, he or she will make those up on other days. And then the tafsir of the next ayah is different as to where, which tafsir you recite and, and you read. But according to one narration, it's mentioned that when fasting initially became obligatory, the Sahaba had the option to give a fidya in case they didn't want to fast. Fasting initially was not a requirement. Fasting in its extremely early days was something that was encouraged. And if they didn't fast, they would give a fidya, right? And then some ulama are of the opinion that, that no, that was not the case. It was always mandatory. And then this yutiqunahu would be translated as la yutiqunahu, uh, that whosoever does not have the strength, fidyatun ta'amu miskin, gives a fidya to feed the poor. We'll come to this in a little while. فَمَنْ تَطَوَّعَ خَيْرًا فَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَهُ Whosoever does, you know, whosoever fasts in the month of Ramadan out of their own accord, فَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَهُ وَأَنْ تَصُومُ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ And that you fast, it is best for you. Again, this is uh, the ayah in, in, in regards to those times when fasting was not mandatory, it was simply encouraged. That if you were to fast, it would be better for you. For us, fasting is mandatory, right? We don't have the option to give um, a fidya. Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an. You know, while I, while I mention this, I should also add that, um, we'll come to this later. Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an hudal linnasi wa bayinatim min al-huda wal-furqan. The month of Ramadan is the month in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed the Qur'an, right? Revealed. We find multiple narrations. One narration mentions that it came from the Lawhum Mahfuz, where the Quran was originally stored and secured. The Lawh Mahfuz, and in the month of Ramadan, it came from Lawhum Mahfuz to the heavens, to the skies of this earth. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala took it down at one time. Right? A lot from Lawhum, that's why we under, when we say the Quran was revealed in Ramadan, how do we understand the revelation of the Quran in Ramadan? Right? We, we always heard that the Quran was revealed over 23 years. So, how, so there's two things that are mentioned. One, that um, the, the Quran came from Lawhum Mahfuz to the skies of this earth. And then from there, as it was needed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed it over a period of 23 years. And when revelation was over, Jibra'il retired and cashed in his 401k. Yet Jibra'il's job, by the way, was to, his job was to bring revelation from God to the prophets. From the time of Adam to the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When the Prophet alayhi sallam left this earth, Jibra'il retired. Jibra'il has had no job ever since. Yeah, he has a very good package. Um... So that's one explanation. The second explanation of this ayah and any other ayah in which it's mentioned that the Qur'an was revealed in Ramadan is that the revelation of the Qur'an began in the month of Ramadan. Right? That Iqra happened to be in the month of Ramadan. And it just so happens that historically speaking, although fasting was not fard until the Prophet's migration in Medina sallallahu alayhi wasallam, 
Ulama, some ulama are of the opinion that it was during the month of Ramadan that the Prophet would go in seclusion, right? Would go away to Hira and spend his time there, right? So he would do this during the month of Ramadan. Um, so yes, we have fasting and then here we have Quran, which will inshallah will use this to um, you know, move on to the the hadith in regards to the month of Ramadan. There's two hadith I want everyone to remember. Although there's quite a few on 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 the screen, there's two I want everyone to remember. And these two pretty much define what we need to do as Muslims in Ramadan. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is narrated to have said. Mansama Ramadana. Mansama Ramadana. Whosoever fasts in the month of Ramadan. In another hadith, which is very similar to this, the Prophet says, Mankama Ramadana. Whosoever stands in the month of Ramadan. Here, Qayyam is referring to Salatul Taraweeh. This is not referring to Qayyamul Layl. This is not referring to some random standing. This is man qama ramadana. Whosoever stands in the month of Ramadan in Taraweeh will come to Taraweeh in the end. These are two separate ahadith. Man sama wa man qama. They both finish exactly the same. Imanan wa ihtisaban ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min dhanbih. Imanan. With faith in God, with faith in Allah, so you need to be a Muslim. Wa ihtisaban and in anticipation of reward from Allah. Right? In anticipation of reward from Allah, غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِهِ In individuals, past sins are forgiven. Now, the anticipating reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could mean two things. One, one meaning is that, that it's such a great act that we don't anticipate a reward except from Allah and no one else. And the reward with Allah is grand. Or the other explanation of this hadith is directly from another hadith in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's a hadith Qudsi, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Himself says in regards to fasting and no other act of worship, ana ajzi bih. Right? For the reward of everything that we do, the prayer, zakah, hajj, whatever we do, all these rewards are recorded by the angels. I anticipate that they've all been upgraded to iPads now. Um, but they all, by the way, you know, it's, as funny as it sounds, the entire discussion on how angels record rewards, it, it can be a four-hour four, can be a four-hour lecture, right? Uh, that the, the last hadith I, I mentioned, the first hadith of Imam Bukhari. That's the first hadith in Imam Bukhari's compilation. Uh, the last hadith is um, Kalimatani, Habibatani ila rahman There are two phrases that are most beloved to Allah, right? Thaqilatani fil mizan, they're extremely heavy in the scale. Khafifatani ala lisan, and they're very easy on the tongue. Subhanallahi wa bihamdihi, Subhanallahi al azim Right, the most best form of remembrance of God happens to be Subhanallahi wa bihamdihi, Subhanallahi al azim Subhanallahi wa bihamdihi, Subhanallahi al azim the reason I mention this is not because of the dhikr. The reason I mention this is mizan, wazan, weight, right? That, the recording, how can phrases that come out of one's mouth have weight? And that's, that's a discussion. But um, the reward of fasting and qiyam is very great. So great that in regards to fasting, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ana ajzibi. I personally will give the reward of the fasting individual. I will not delegate this to some angel. I myself will do this. Right? Just imagine a, a very busy person has people doing things, but decides to do something himself or herself. Right? That's big. Like, oh wow, they're really go they're going out of their way for this. That's that's fasting. So don't underestimate or don't just imagine our fast to be some random fast in some random month of Ramadan in this life of ours. 
right? It's, it's very particular. We begin in a certain specific method in the morning, we end with a certain specific method at the end, and it's so great, it's such a great act of worship that there is, the reward is so great that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself says, Ana I will give the reward. The other thing I'm going to mention here, people ask, which action is the best action? Not in Ramadan, just on a random day. It's July 14th, the 15th today, right? What's the best action? You want to be very you want to get very close to Allah. You want something from Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. What's the best action? The answer to this, the best action is that in which one is most sincere. We happen to be by nature, especially in the West and especially in the United States, a community that does nothing but boast about what we do. Be it masjid affairs, be it things at work, it's just a society. Bios, right? People's bios, resumes. What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to, you're supposed to pay someone hundreds of dollars to make it sound like you read your own bio and you read your own resume and you're like, who is this? Right? You just paid someone a lot of money to make you look really nice. And people boast, oh, I started this at the masjid. Uh, we did this. We'll just add alhamdulillah to it. Alhamdulillah, we did this, but we, we boast. In all honesty, the, the, the best of all actions is regardless of what happens, one absolutely never talks about it. That is the best action. Even if people need to know at times. Just... That's, that's sincerity. That, it's between you and your Lord. To the extent where I had this discussion with one of my teachers and I said, but you know, sometimes people need to know that, you know, we did this. And they'll say, you don't, if you have true faith in Allah, you don't need to tell them. Allah will put in their heart, because Allah, in the qalb bayna usbu'i rahman right? The hearts of believers are between, if the, the, the hadith goes between the fingers of the most merciful, right? Allah turns, you know, you have a little marble, a little bead in your, in your finger. What do you do? You can turn it around. You can do what you want, right? You can move it around. That's, Allah, that's how the Prophet ﷺ explains our condition, that our hearts, the hearts of human beings are between the fingers. Allah doesn't have fingers. It's just, an, it's just a, a form of explaining is, is that uh, it's between the fingers of the most merciful. He changes them. So the people that you are trying to tell that you did a good job, your action should be so sincere, so it should be between you and your Lord, that Allah will do the job of changing their hearts and for them to have good feelings towards you. That's the highest level of taqwa. It takes a lot to get there. It doesn't come without practice. Okay, these things don't come without practice. These things come after having spent years and years in the service of your teachers. Right? These things don't, don't come just like that. Sincerity. We're talking about sincerity. Two actions. So I did mention the action which is best is that in which you're extremely sincere. And the ulama mentioned two things. One of those actions happens to be fasting. Because when you're fasting, unless and otherwise you tell anyone, no one knows. I don't know how many of you are fasting right now. All of you could be fasting, half of you could be fasting, ten of you could be fasting, no one knows. Right? That's the most sincere act. The second most sincere action is the hajjud. Why? Because you could get up, you could make, use the bathroom, Make wudu, pray, go back to sleep, and the person you're sleeping next to doesn't know that you did that. They're just snoring away. Right? That's why sincerity. That's why uh, in, in, amongst, in this discussion, there's a whole other discussion altogether. Whether qayamul layl, the tahajjud prayer. It, 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 there's, there's two discussions. A, whether it's allowed in congregation or not. And then the second discussion is whether it's preferred in congregation or not. I'm not going to go into the allowed one right now. But whether it's preferred or not, there are scholars of the opinion that tahajjud, qiyamul layl, is preferred on your own. Why? Because it's between you and Allah. No one knows. 
right? It's in the darkness, in the middle of the night, no one knows. When you go, go there's, I'm not saying going to the masjid is not okay. You can go to the masjid, but when you go to the masjid, 20 other people know that you're there, right? So your reward definitely drops a few notches because we're human beings. If we go one day, two days, three days, if we go very regularly, then, you know, you may start feeling a little better about yourself and they'll see they know that I prayed the hajjud. Right? That's human nature. I, I just met, I met a friend of mine who I did hajj with last year. We were, we were together last night in Detroit and he says, <coughs> he says that there's another individual that went for hajj with us and, and um, he did something better than others. But uh, now after he came back from Hajj, he's been doing nothing ever since but boasting about it. What's the point? If you're going to do something good and you're going to boast about it, your rewards are gone. Right? That's why they say the hadith, the Prophet wasallam says that arrogance burns away good deeds like fire burns dry wood. Right? So we need to be very careful, very conscious, very to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I mentioned two ahadith. Man saama Ramadana, whosoever fasts, and man qama Ramadana. By the way, these two ahadith mention the essence of the entire month of Ramadan. Okay, the entire month of Ramadan are found in these two ahadith. Khair, we will move on inshaAllah. The word Ramadan originates from the root Ramad, Ra, Meem, Dad, which means scorching heat, dryness. Um, some ulama are of the opinion that it, Ramadan is called Ramadan because the, of the extreme heat when the fasting was made mandatory and obligatory, extremely hot days. Some scholars are of the opinion that the reason it's called Ramadan because um, of extreme thirst, you start becoming dry and hot. Um, some scholars are of the opinion that it's the heat, heat is, you know, comes from fire, right? Heat comes from fire, that it's in this heat and in this dryness, our sins are wiped out. And some scholars mention that Ramadan is called Ramadan because when you have something that's very hot, fire, right? It's so hot that it can melt things like metal. And you can mold something as difficult and hard as metal into whatever you want. And this is meant to be a, 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 a ceremony in which we, um, we mold ourselves, right? During the course of the month, we mold ourselves into better individuals. That's why Ramadan is called uh, Ramadan. Some have mentioned that it means scarcity of rations. Um, you know, people don't we, don't, we don't eat as much as we normally do during the month of Ramadan, hopefully. Um, it is Allah's gift to mankind. Why is it a gift? It's a gift because Allah, again this goes right back to what I mentioned earlier. Ramadan is a month which is dedicated for the direct acts of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because Allah wants us to directly worship Him and Him alone, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it easy for us and He locks up the shaitan. Right, so Allah says, look, this is what I want you to do. And you're round, you blame the shaitan, shaitan this, shaitan that. So here I'm going to do you a favor, I'm going to take this shaitan, this iblis, and his crew and his croonies and his gang and whatever else, I'm going to lock them up. 29 or 30 days they're locked up. Now, what that also means is that during the course of that time, you define who you really are. You, if anyone wants to ask themselves, who am I? What am I really made of? What kind of a Muslim I am? Then the month of Ramadan is that deciding factor. The month of Ramadan is that time when you get your answer. If you happen to be a God obedient individual, that's who you are. You're a God obedient individual that sometimes is influenced by the shaitan. And if you, even in the month of Ramadan, are not God obedient, then that's your lower, that's your lower self, the nafs. And to work on your nafs is another thing altogether. Uh, that's, that's by the way, that's another thing. People, you know, as Muslims, we generally learn how to pray, recite Qur'an, uh, or actually in certain cultures you just read the Qur'an once in your life and then you're done. Um, and then, um, you know, you, there's certain things that you do and then you're done. 
right? When the Prophet ﷺ mentions in the hadith, Mal Ihsan, what is Ihsan? What is perfection? An ta'budallaha ka annaka tarafa illam takun tarafa innahu yarak. You worship Allah as if you see him. If you don't see him, know that he sees you, right? That is where tazkiyah comes in, right? Purification of the heart. First, understanding, knowing the diseases of the heart. Once you've recognized the diseases of the heart, then to be able to figure out which ones you have or we have, and then to find a physician, right? To find a spiritual doctor in order to assist you to remove us, remove those uh, diseases from us. That in and of itself is, is a process that takes years, right? Years. We don't even think about that. We don't even think that exists. Right? In certain parts of the world, we call them Sufis, and Sufi is a bad word. Right? It's tazkiya, tasawwuf, whatever you want to call it, but there, there's a process for that. Khair. So, shaitan is in chains. You have no one but to blame but yourself. Uh, uh, Ramadan was made obligatory during the, um, the second year of Hijrah. The Prophet wasallam fasted uh, for nine years. The obligatory fast from dawn to sunset for nine years. I just gave away an answer to a question that I'm going to ask later on. So, why do we fast? Because Allah told us to, and we're going to burn in hell if we don't. It's beyond that. Last night I was, I, I delivered three back to, I don't know how they made me do this, but somehow they did. They made me do three back to back lectures, right? From Maghrib to, uh, from before Maghrib and then from Maghrib to Isha and after Isha. Um, and they were lengthy <laughs> lectures. Um, and I was mentioning how we need to bring into us the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that we love Allah so much that we're shy to disobey Him, right? That we love Allah so much that we're actually shy. We feel ashamed to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We feel, we ask, we say to ourselves, how can I let God down, right? That's what we need to incorporate into our lives, you know? That's what we do with our parents, your boss, Right? You want to be so, so nice and go out of your way to do things because if, if, you, if, you, if you don't, like you feel so bad, how could I let my parents down? You know, how could I let my friends down? That's how close Allah needs, we need to feel Allah that close to us. Allah is that close to us. He's closer to us than our jugular vein. But that said, we need to feel that. We need to incorporate that feeling. We need to have that feeling. We need to know that feeling to the extent where we're so close to Allah that we don't want to do anything wrong. We feel like that we're letting him down. Right? So number of reasons the ulama mentioned while I was talking, many of you have already read them because I've been looking at your faces and you're not looking at me. So I know you've already read them. Um, but you know, appreciate, give thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, continuously give thanks to Allah give up things that are haram, weakens the shaitan, you know, always, always conscious of the fact that Allah is watching us, um, you know, to, to be able to, to make do with the little that we have. We don't need a lot, right? We don't need a lot. Most of us don't realize that all the things that we have in life, we actually don't need them. Yeah, we've become slaves to our own nafs. That's why a lot of times we can't blame the shaitan. We need to start, the first person we need to blame is our own self, right? That's where, it, that's where the journey begins. It's very easy to blame someone else. Blame yourself, right? That's why I generally tell people that if you're going to go shopping for anything and you're going to buy, you're going to, you're going to acquire anything, ask yourself, do you need it or do you want it, right? Do you need it or do you want it? That's why there's a hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not the exact words, but the meaning is to the effect of that half of one's wealth is just saving your money, is not being extravagant in your expenditure. That's half of one's wealth. Yeah, that's why most American Muslims can't retire, ever. Most Americans can't retire, ever. 
because there's so many things that we've put our, we, you know, there's just so much that we have and expectations and the lifestyles that we set for ourselves that it's a never ending story. All right? And I still can't fathom people who buy homes at the ages of 40 and 50 with a 30 year mortgage. You know, like they're going to be paying the same mortgage at the age of 65, 66. Really? And of course, there's no concept of paying it off. Right? I mean, if you have enough equity, you just pull it back out to do something else. Right? It's, that's not the lifestyle we need. The lifestyle we need is a very simple lifestyle. Our goal should be that towards the end of our lives, we're living somewhere close by the masjid and we're coming to the masjid for Fajr every day. We're coming to the masjid for Isha every day. That should be our goal in life. Khair. And the, and the last point, you know, getting used to doing a great deal of acts of worship. Um, Psalm. What is Psalm? What is fasting? To withhold, this is, this is the definition uh, that is found in the, um, in the books of fiqh. To withhold from the, the legal definition, to withhold from eating, drinking, and intercourse during the daylight hours. With the intention of fasting, you have to have the intention, performed by one who is capable and required. So you can't expect a seven-year-old kid to fast, yet at the same time you can't expect an elderly ill person to fast, or an ill person, period, regardless of whether they're elderly or not. Um, Daylight hours. When does the daylight hour begin? What is daylight? What, is, what does Islam define as daylight? No one? Subh Sadiq. Not sunrise. I've heard a lot of Muslims say we fast from sunrise to sunset. We don't fast from sunrise to sunset. We fast from dawn to sunset. And dawn is just the try to be English definition of the word, the Arabic word, Subh Sadiq. Subh Sadiq is translated as true dawn. Why is it true dawn? Because there's a false dawn as well. But um, fasting begins at true dawn, Subh Sadiq which also means that one must have completed eating prior to Subh Sadiq, right? And one must also know that the time of Fajr begins at Subh Sadiq. So the Adhan is called after Subh Sadiq. I might as well mention it. <clears throat> There's two things I need to mention here. One. There's a hadith, the Prophet, in which we find that Bilal radiallahu anhu would be calling the adhan and the Prophet salam would be eating. So a lot of people we find right here amongst ourselves that while the adhan is being called, they're still eating in the morning. The adhan on the clocks, the adhan in the masjid, wherever it may be, they're still eating and they say, Oh, it's the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ, Bilal would call the adhan, he'd still be eating. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, Sahih hadith found in Bukhari and Muslim, in which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi is narrated that the Prophet ﷺ, uh, Ramadan in Ramadan, the adhan of Bilal radiallahu an was not the adhan for Fajr. It was the adhan that was the indicator that the time of suhoor is about to end. So when you go to your local masjid and you find all these people eating while the muadhin is calling the adhan, wrong. People only want what they, what's convenient for them. The hadith that's mentioned, and I mentioned the wrong Sahabi two nights ago at the MCA. I mentioned Uthman ibn Mad'un, but it wasn't Uthman ibn Mad'un. Rather, it was Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum radiallahu an. During the month of Ramadan, the adhan of Fajr was called by Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum radiallahu an. So when people mention that adhan of Bilal and say the Prophet was eating, know that that wasn't the adhan for Fajr. That was the adhan which was the indicator that the time for suhoor is about to end and the adhan of Fajr was called by Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum Because you have to understand, 
if this is true dawn, the time for suhoor ends and then the time for adhan begins. How can, while the adhan is being called and the time for suhoor has ended, how can one continue eating? Does it make sense? So know that. Now, don't go around ta telling people what you're doing is wrong. You don't get into arguments. People are not going to listen. Right? Just know what's right and follow that which is right. The second thing I should mention when it comes to suhoor, because we're talking about daylight hours. Suhoor. Hmm. You see, these are so lengthy discussions that when I have to like put them into like four minutes, I become so difficult. The times for Isha and Fajr are calculated based on the degrees of the sun from the horizon. Okay, you don't need to know all these details, but just understand that much. The predominant degrees that are followed here in the United States are the 15 and 18 degree methods. Most mas Isna's official position is 15 degrees and most masjids in the United States have adopted the 15 degree method. What is the 15 degree method? The 15 degree method is longer night. Isha comes in early, Fajr comes in late. <laughs> That's what we want, right? Brother, deen is easy, don't make it difficult. Early Isha, late Fajr. That's the predominant calendars that you will find. Then you have the 18 degree method, which is a smaller night. Isha comes in late and Fajr comes in early. The time difference, depending on where you are, especially in North America, whether you're as far south as San Diego or as far north as Vancouver, um, that variation could be quite a bit. So the ulama generally mention that, and there's a lot of opinions, but the predominant opinion in this regard is that Isha can be prayed at 15 degrees, Fajr should still be prayed at 18 degrees. And then some are of the opinion that you can pray Fajr at 15 degrees. Generally, we follow the 15 degree opinion, late Fajr, say thank you to us, and um, you know, go on and do that. That said, I, I mention this because some of you may recall certain Ramadan calendars up until about four or five years ago had a stop eating time. Do you remember that? Yes. Yeah, you remember that. And then you asked, oh my God, why did you get rid of it? <laughs> right? There was a specific reason behind that. The reason behind that was because once, and the, the, the difference here in the bay is about 15 minutes between the 18 and the 15 degrees. So for example, can someone just check the calendar really quickly and see what time Suhoor is the first day? 437. 437. 4.37? That's a 15 degree time. So if you follow the 18 degree time, it would be about 4.23. So the real specific reason behind that is we would have people stop eating at the 18 degree time because according to some, at 18 degrees, Fajr does begin. So just to be on the safe side, stop eating and then wait for Fajr to begin. And then utilize that time in between to brush your teeth, make the hajjud or whatever you needed to. That was the general idea behind this. Um, but in all honesty, it's not a requirement. And in order to make it easy on people, uh, we decided to delete the whole stop eating time altogether. That said, if so, in our own household, uh, we have individuals uh, that follow the 18 degree time and who follow the 15 degree time. No one fights, no one argues, no one tells the other they're wrong, right? Oh, you should do this. No, there's no you should do this. Whoever wants to do the 18 degree time, they wake up early, do their suhoor. Whoever wants to do the 15 degree time, they wake up late, they do their suhoor. We still pray Fajr together, we hug each other, and we're still brothers and sisters in Islam. Right? There's no need to argue about all of this. Um, fasting is divided into seven categories. Depending on which book of fiqh you use, it could be five categories, six categories, seven categories. Um, I don't plan to go into detail in, these, in regards to these categories. Fard fasts, of course, the month of Ramadan. The a fard fast can, uh, uh, an example of a fard fast can also be that one, an individual intends that, um, Ya Allah, if I get a call tonight and I get a job, I will fast tomorrow. That you've just made it mandatory unto yourself to fast the next day. 
um, uh, nidr, manzur, uh, vow, right? Uh, a mandatory fast is that which, it, it's a makeup of a voluntary fast. So a voluntary, say tomorrow you decide to fast. You just want to fast? You decide, you, you know, you went to this workshop and oh my God, fasting is very good and I'm going to fast. And so you decide to fast tomorrow and then Uthar calls you, Uthar sends you an email and says, let's meet for lunch. You know, we're, right before Ramadan begins, you know, go, go for lunch. Uthar, I'm hinting something here in case you haven't got it. Um, um, and you go for lunch. Now, a voluntary fast, if someone, the, the stipulation, the mas'ala is that if it's a voluntary fast and someone invites you for a meal, you can break your fast. In fact, according to some ulama, it's preferred that you break your fast. Uh, and the reasons for preference are many. One, that someone has invited you, you shouldn't say no. Two, maximum sincerity. You're not letting them know that you are fasting. Right? It's all about sincerity. You're not, you just eat, alhamdulillah. But as soon as you break a voluntary fast, now it's required for you to make up that fast. It was voluntary to begin with, but once you started it, and if you broke it later on, for whatever reason, um, now it's mandatory to, to make it up. Sunnah fasts, right? Ashura, some ulama mentioned that it's only Ashura, some ulama, they, they bring, they make the sunnah and recommended categories together, the fasting of Mondays and Thursdays, the six days of Shawwal, the voluntary fasts, um, any, any day, whenever you feel like fasting. Um, makruh tahreem fasts are the days of Eid, the ayyam al tashriq, the three days after Eid al Adha. Um, and mildly disliked are um, fasting, for example, Ashura alone, because the Prophet reminds us to fast two days, either the 9th and the 10th or the 10th and the 11th, or specifically fasting on a Friday, according to some scholars, specifically fasting on a given Saturday because these were times when people of other faiths specifically used to fast and to specify that one day. Khair, so that's, that's in brief seven types of fasts. Um, intention, the intention can be divided into two. When do you need to be specific in your intention and when you do not need to be um, specific in your intention. So you need to be specific in, when you're making up a qada when you're making up a past, a, a fast that you missed in Ramadan and you're making that up, you need to be specific in your intention. But this, by the way, these rulings don't just have to do with the fast of Ramadan. These have to do with fast, fasting, period. Um, that is, say you missed five fasts in the month of Ramadan and now in August, in December, right? Short days. Um, you're making it up in December. And so when you wake up in the morning, you, you have to have the intention that this is a fast that I'm making up of the mist of Ramadan. You can't just randomly fast and then say I'm fasting of the mist of Ramadan. So again, the same case with zakah, giving in charity, right? When you give charity, zakah, zakat. When you give charity at the time of giving, you must have the intention that that is zakah. You can't give and then later on decide that you're going to convert that into zakah. Right? Someone says, oh, we need some money, you give $500, and then two days later, you decide and say, oh, that $500, i am going to calculate towards my zakah. Your zakah is not given. It must be calculated at that given time. There's an entire slide on zakah that I have, and I will cover that later, inshaAllah. Again, I, uh, the second uh, category here is makeup of any voluntary fast. I gave the example of a voluntary fast that you broke because someone invited you. If you're making up that fast, the intention has to be specific. The fasting of expiation, kafara. I'm going to come to this in one of the next two slides or maybe three slides, I don't know. The fasting of expiation, you need to be specific that this fast is for a kafara, this fast is for a kafara, this fast for, is for a kafara. By the way, the fasting of kafara is 60 days consecutively. We're going to come to that. Unspecified vows, right? It's not a specified vow, but you vowed that you were going to um, a fast. And so that, Ya Allah, I'm fasting today for a vow that I had to fast four days. And this is the two of the four, or three of the four, or the four of the four. See, I told you, it was pretty good, huh? Um, kafara. Actually, let's, let's do the next slide and then we'll come back to that. Non-specific intention, the fasting of Ramadan. This fast, this intention, you could make until Dahwa Kubra. What's Dahwa Kubra? The middle of the day. The middle of the day is not the middle of the day at noon. In Islam, noon is not at 12 o'clock. In Islam, noon is when the sun is right above your head. And on summer days, noon is closer to 1 than 12. Right? So keep that in mind. So again, you have 
the beginning of the day and then you have the sunset. The time in between, that's the half. You can make the intention up until there. So the fasting of Ramadan, till the half of the day, someone fell asleep, had a long night, missed Fajr in the morning, missed Suhoor. The people when they miss uh, Fajr in the morning in Ramadan, they're usually more worried about missing the Suhoor part than missing the Fajr part. <laughs> Which is kind of sad. Right? The Fard comes before the Sunnah. Uh, Ramadan, uh, you have to be, it's a non-specific intention. I'm fasting Ramadan. It doesn't have to be the second day, third day of Ramadan. It's just a, just a, uh, an intention. Specified vows, right? Specific vow. Ya Allah, if I get this job, I will fast on Wednesday. Ya Allah, if I, if I get into this school, I will fast uh, the second day after Ramadan, right? So specified. So you can, because you've already specified the day. That's why the niyyah doesn't have to be specific. And then voluntary fasts. Right, nafila fast. You could wake up for Fajr, go to sleep while not having anything, and then wake up at 11 o'clock, and then all of a sudden decide, Aj Roza rakna hai. Right, then I'm going to fast today because Maghrib is going to be at 4.30 and I can get away. There's nothing wrong with that, by the way. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. We should. Most Muslims today are not in the habit of fasting. Where fasting is supposed to be a part of our lives. It's supposed to be a very regular part of our lives. We don't fast. We just don't. We should get into this habit. Right? At least once a week. At least start by fasting on Mondays or Thursdays once a week. This one day will turn into two. And, and to become close to Allah. So that's intentions. Kafara. What's a kafara? It's an expiation. What's an expiation? It's fasting 60 days consecutively. Don't look at the slide. Well, here. If you break, if you either break the fast of Ramadan without a valid reason or you do not keep a fast in Ramadan without a valid shari reason then not only do you have to make up the fast that you missed but you have to do a kafara you have to pay an expiation so say you're a kid 15 16 you decide mom and dad are not looking hot day popsicle or you're just away from home and you're not a very practicing Muslim. You're like, to heck with Ramadan. Why do I got to do all that? And then at the age of 40, when you have a few white hairs, you come to realize, I got to be a Muslim. And then you realize you missed some fasts. You got to make up those fasts. Okay? Not valid reason, invalid reason for breaking the fast or not keeping the fast. There are valid reasons. For that, you don't have to give a kafara. But not valid reasons, just randomly deciding not to fast. I've come across individuals who haven't fasted for 10 years. That's not a lot, by the way. 10 times 30 is what? 300? Fast one day a week, 50 every year. You know what I'm saying? Not too bad. A few years, you're done. It, it doesn't, it's not a lot, by the way. Our lives go by. You know what I'm saying? Five, six years have just gone by like this. Like, you know, you've been, just imagine how long have you been at your last job? How long have you been at your last home? Time flies. So one fast a week, four or five years, it's not a lot. You can make it up. It's doable. Here's the tough part though. The expiation. You have to give one expiation as a penalty for all of those, whether it was one fast that you broke or whether it was a hundred fasts that you did not keep or you broke. The expiation is one. What's the expiation? Fasting 60 days consecutively. What does that mean? That means that if you miss the 60th day, you start all over again. It's a penalty. It's not meant to be easy. It is not meant to be easy. That's why you can't begin the expiation after Eid al-Fitr. Why not? Sorry? Eid al-Adha gets in the way. Eid al-Adha gets in the way. So you have to start after Eid al-Adha. The women have it a little easier than the men because the days that the women miss, they miss. Right? You miss those days, you pass along, you just, that's how you complete your 60. Guys, we don't have it that easy. Okay, it's 60 days, one shot. You miss day 59, start. And by the way, you can feed poor people, but that's not an option. It's not an option that you can do this, this, or this. You have to fast for 60 days, if you can't fast for 60 days. And the if is not decided by you, the if is decided by the Prophet Then 
you can move on to the next category or the next category or the next category. The if is not decided by, um, by, uh, by, uh, by us, like, oh, no, no, I can't fast for 60 days, I will... No, it's too difficult, Brother Tahir. <laughs> not my, it's not my decision here. It's the Prophet's decision, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So one, now by the way, on a more serious note, if for whatever reason in our past life we've, for whatever reason, just had missed a fast or whatever, at least make the intention that someday, inshallah, we will at least make up the missed fasts. And then hopefully sooner than later do the kafara. I know, I know, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I know a lot of people that have done the kafara. Yeah, I know a lot of people. Um, they don't tell the world, they're like, oh yeah, it's not a Facebook post. I've started my kafara today. <laughs> you don't tweet about your kafaras. Okay. Uh, they quietly do their kafara. They become non-social. They don't want the world to know, rightfully. Um, and they quietly do their kafara. And um, they get done with it. Right? So it's doable. But it is, it is a penalty. It must be paid. Exemptions. People who are exempted from fasting in the month of Ramadan. People who are ill. فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا If you're ill. So ill that you cannot fast. Now this is again defined into two categories. You're, so, you're ill in Ramadan, so you're going to make it up later. You must make those up later. Or you're so ill that you're never going to be able to make up the fasts. Then there's, they have to give a fidya. Right? So ill, an ill person, a pregnant or nursing woman. A pregnant or nursing woman must make up the fasts that she misses. Giving a fidya is not an option. For many women, they think that, oh, I'll give the fidya, and then if I can make them up later on, I'll do that also. Uh -uh -uh -uh. Don't work like that. You must make up the fast that you missed. I should also mention that you do not have to make them up prior to the next Ramadan, which is a very daisy thing. Oh, you have to make it up before the next Ramadan. I've actually, here's the best one. Oh, since you haven't made it up until the next Ramadan, now you don't have to make them up. Oh my dear auntie, where are you getting these rules? You know, don't home bake my rules. These rules come from the Quran and the Sunnah. Okay, they're not my homemade. I don't make these up at home. Uh, you must make them up, um, whether the next year, the year after, whatever, whenever you can. However, they don't have to be done consecutively. You can do them once a week, once every two weeks, once every three weeks. Eventually, make up the fasts. Just because you're pregnant doesn't mean that oh, I'm not going to fast anymore. I've, I actually know so many pregnant women that have fast into their eighth month of pregnancy with conviction in Allah that barakah will come through my fast into this child. And, they're ex and how do they justify their fasting despite the fact that their doctors don't tell them not to? They say that, look, I sleep 12 hours in the night and I don't get hungry. I'll just stay up in the night and eat a lot. <laughs> and I'll just fast during the 12 hours of the day. And I'm, I'm telling you, I, I personally no women who've done this and they have like a major diet plan like you know their shakes and their high protein foods and just eating every two hours and then they, they fast it, which is the equivalent and of course mashallah their families and their husbands will support them so that they can get through the day without doing you know extra amounts of work it's doable so just because you're like fasting doesn't mean like just because you're pregnant I'm not gonna fast anymore now like think about it if you can khair alhamdulillah if you can't no big deal I'm not expecting anyone to fast. Severe thirst. So someone asked me yesterday, what does severe thirst mean? Severe thirst means if you don't drink, you're going to die. It's intense. You don't just break your fast. If we think we have it bad, why don't we travel to the Middle East and see the Pakistani, Bengali, Indian laborers that have to work building these buildings in Dubai that you and I go and see and have a great time in. So ask them how difficult it is. Traveler, if you're a traveler, you don't have to fast. Um, people ask, how do you fast when you're traveling? You don't fast based on the watch. You fast based on the uh, subh sadiq and the sunset of where you are. So if you get on a plane from here, you're traveling east, you will break the fast as soon as the sun sets in the airplane. Or if you're traveling west, you'll break your fast as soon as the sun sets in the airplane. Or if you're traveling west, your fast may be longer after, because if you land before sunset, then you're... So, so there. And then there's people who will, for example, travel to places like you know, the Far East, you know, they're flying on Cathay or China Air or whatever, and they're missing an entire day altogether. They still want, you don't fast in those cases. Just don't fast. 
Whatever day you missed, you just make those up. If you're traveling in some countries, you may end up doing 31 days. But because you're there, you must fast. You can't stop fasting at day 30 and say, this is khatam. No, you have to finish. It could be 29. If it's 28, by the way, for whatever reason, because Muslims in America started to decide to go by calculation, totally screwed up the actual date, which is what's going to happen this year. Um, and then you may only have 28 fasts. Then you must after Ramadan make up one because the minimum is 29. But you could, if you need to, you could go up to 31. You don't stop in 30 and say, I'm okay, I don't gonna fast today, I'm gonna make Eid with you tomorrow. Um, sports, training, these are not valid reasons for one to break the fast. A lot of young individuals ask, swimming, basketball, things like that, not valid reason. You gotta give those up. Or do it and still continue to fast, right? Sharia comes first. Before we go, one last stipulation. Fidya. Fidya is the Fidya is the amount that we give for not making, for not doing a fast and not being able to make up that fast either. A person is so ill, right? They're old, they're alive, but they're old that they're not going to be able to make up the fast. And even after Ramadan ends, there's no hope of them making up that fast. So they give a fidya. The amount of fidya is the same as Sadaqatul Fitr, Zakatul Fitr, Fitra, Fitrana. I just said it in like four different languages. Whichever one you subscribe to, pick and choose. Fitrana, Fitra, Sadaqatul Fitr, Zakatul Fitr, whatever you call it, it's the same thing. The method of calculation is exactly the same. Are you with me? So whether it's Zakat, that's why if you ever need to figure out the Fidya, you don't have to like get all worried. Just look at the amount of Sadaqat al on the Masjid box and that's the amount of Fidya. Now, the methods of calculating the Fidya are based on grains that the Prophet wasallam gave. And the method was either a half a sa' or one sa'. These were specific amounts. Imagine it to be a pound or two pounds. And the Prophet ﷺ gave different grains at different times. So based, this, these are last year's numbers, based on wheat, right? The fidya comes to $6, barley $15, raisins $21, dates $33. If you're giving it as a fidya, it's per person per day. If you're using this amount as a sadaqatul fitr, it's per person. And in regards to Sadaqatul Fitr, Zakatul Fitr, Fitra, you should also know that you give it on behalf of everyone in your family, even the children who haven't reached the age of puberty. Right? So keep these things in mind. Okay, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Um, Imam Ghazali Rahmatullahi Alayh mentions. So we've moved on from the fiqh of fasting. By the way, that fiqh of fasting can be very, very detailed, but um, we sort of just went through it in brief. Uh, Imam Ghazali mentions the three grades of fasting. One, that's the ordinary fast. The ordinary fast is that in which you, or in which we, no eat, no drink, right? No, in, no relations with our spouses. That's pretty much it, right? Which is sort of your, I'm sorry, got it? Uh, which is sort of your average layman's fast, right? The only thing we don't do is no eating, no drinking, no relations with our spouses, but our lives continue to go on like it's any other day. Right? That is just an ordinary fast and our reward will be very ordinary. It's not going to be a special reward. The second fast or the second kind of fast as Imam Ghazali mentions is a special kind of fast. He mentions in this category and this is a very lengthy category in his Ihya Ulum al Deen, um, see not which is prohibited by Allah, speak not which is prohibited by Allah, hear not which is prohibited by Allah, do not which is prohibited by Allah, avoid overeating, and look to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with fear and hope. Now, 
Very briefly, if we were to go into each one of these categories, seeing not, to not look at, to not see anything which is prohibited by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, our threshold of that which is prohibited by Allah is actually very low. And I'm going to give you an example, and this example will bring things to perspective. Sheikh Salik, you know Sheikh Salik? Sheikh Salik is a Mauritanian Sheikh who lives in Hayward, old school. Been here for about 10 years, very old school. Still makes wudu out of a cup because he says that's closest to the sunnah, right? Very old school. When he came here some years ago, some of the students around him decided to take him to UC Berkeley for a lecture. And he agreed. When he got there and he got outside the car, he screamed. And his scream and his complaint was, why are these people naked? There was no one naked there to our standards. Our threshold is very low. Our threshold of naked is extreme naked. His threshold of naked was anyone, who, man or woman, that wasn't covered. Right? So that's something that, you know, and he, by the way, he didn't deliver a lecture there that afternoon. He left. He saw guys and girls in shorts and tanks, and he thought that was naked. Right? So when we talk about seeing not, some of us go to, in our mind, we think of some ex something very extreme, like, oh, I'm not supposed to see this. No, it's even day in, day out. Billboards, the way people are dressed at the malls. Right? Think, so basic, now, even the way people are dressed at work, but we, must, we need to go to work, whereas we don't need to go to the mall. There's a distinct difference. Do you need to go to the mall? No, you don't. Do you need to go to work? Yeah, you do. Right? So there's a distinct difference. And avoiding, avoiding, as, as when, you, when you read the books of Tazkiyah, one of the things that's mentioned is, for example, when you, know, when you know someone is doing or saying something and they don't know you're there, taqwa means to turn away and not listen to it. Taqwa means to turn away from there. Between you and Allah, whether they know you're there or not, doesn't matter. Like, so for example, if you have a two-story house and the neighbors around you have one-story homes and they're out in their backyard, they don't see that you can see them in their backyard. But taqwa is that you shut your blinds and you don't look at them, you turn away. Because we are accountable to Allah. That is a good Muslim. That's a good person. Right? So seeing not which Allah has prohibited. Speak not which Allah has prohib prohibited. Lying, right? cursing, gossiping. Very common, right? I mean, from certain, in certain cultures, gossip is part of your day-to-day -day life. Doesn't matter whether you're fasting or not. You have to get a phone call every day from someone. You know what happened? No, I don't. Yeah, any any kind of any kind of speaking. <laughs> In fact, I was mentioning yesterday that if someone older than you calls you and begins to gossip, just hang up, and you can later on tell them your battery died. That would be a permissible lying. <laughs> if you can't tell them, if you can't tell them, like, look, mom, you're gossiping. I'm done. If you, can't, if you don't have the guts to do that, then just hang up and tell them the battery died. No, like really. You know, I've been going, and I would urge you to get this. I've been going through this book, The Ramadan of Sheikh Muhammad Zakaria and Other Elders. Sheikh Muhammad Zakaria uh, was a scholar from uh, the Indo subcontinent, spent the last few years of his life in Medina Munawwara. And because of the commentary that he wrote, on the Sahih of Imam Bukhari, the Saudi scholars revered him and when he passed away, uh, the time that was spent between his, uh, between his death and his burial, it, he, his janazah was prepared in 30 minutes. And he was buried within an hour of his death and he is buried right next to the wives of the Messenger wasallam. He happens to be my father's sheikh and my father spent six years with him. And my cousin, some of you know my cousin Imam Siraj, Imam Siraj's father spent 13 years with him. And let me tell you, my father says that when we, they call him Hazrat Sheikh, 
And when, when my dad, when I read, the, he, there's an autobiography that he has written of how he was raised. And when, when, I read the, when I read the autobiography, we read it with my father. My father says, you're just reading it out of a book. I can picture my sheikh saying it, the way his facial expressions were, were and his hands were. You know, he died, he died in the early 80s. My father spent six Ramadans there. My father says, Beta, we only had one rule. I was like, wow, that's a pretty easy rule. You couldn't speak. You only had one rule. This was in Saharanpur, in UP, in India, for those individuals who know in India. You were not allowed to speak. That was it. He says, one month, no speaking. And you, you didn't get into trouble if you spoke. It was between you and he would just announce it. If you want to be my student, if you want to spend your Ramadan here, this is one rule. If you break that rule, you're accountable. It's between you and Allah. Right. So, and it, it, just imagine so much. We'd, we'd be saving so much time. And, and uh, you, know, you know what else falls into this category? Unnecessary chatting, Facebooking, tweeting, all of that. It's all a waste of time. Right? It's Ramadan, this goes right back to the first thing I mentioned. Ramadan is about the direct ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you don't need to be there, you don't need to be there. And now, that, so, so you know, a very common question is, so Imam Tahir, what do you expect us to do? Read the Quran all day? Yeah. <laughs> and you need, it's, it's a training manual. You get, you, you know, when you're, when you're younger, you have little money, you learn to live. You get more money, you learn to live. You have a better job, you learn to live. You buy a bigger house, you buy more furniture. Right? Spiritually, that's where we need to go. If we were reciting five juz the year before, it should be six this year. In 30 years, you'll get to 30 juz per day. But you need to get there. Right? I remember when I, I, I had the honor of spending some, a few Ramadans with my grandfather, rahmatullahi alayhi. My grandfather in his 80s would complete one recitation of the Quran daily. And that was not a big deal. That was the norm. That was the, that was the norm amongst the pious men and women of town. Right? It was just the norm. Right? I mean, I tell you, the, the ways of the pious were, yes, to recite Quran daily. I have numerous teachers, numerous teachers, who complete the Quran daily in their voluntary salah. Daily. So the sunnah of dhuhr takes them at least an hour. And then they go to the masjid just for the fard prayer. And then the sunnah, they come back home, and the next two sunnah, it takes them another half an hour. Because they're reciting the Qur'an from memory in their salah. Those who are not hafiz of the Qur'an, they would recite the Qur'an. But like they, these are people in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. But they took them, their lives, it, they, they, they got there. They eventually got there. It's a journey. Right? It's a journey, you get there. Even amongst us cousins and brothers, we in Ramadan actually have competitions. We have internal competitions. Like who's going to finish the most number of Qur'ans this year? Right? And then we sometimes set aside a day and say that tomorrow we're going to recite, so this is after the khatm and taraweeh, like tomorrow we're going to recite the Qur'an in one entire day. How many of you have joined the bandwagon? And like cousins, males and females, we all like join the bandwagon and we complete, we complete the khatm. For, and we do it for our grandparents. Right? That's why I tell you, I was, I was mentioning this. It is... I find it almost impossible to see, to, to meet anyone, a scholar in the United States, who would like show us this Ramadan through their actions. That's why it's very common in England where we have scholars, we just invite scholars from the Indo subcontinent or the Arab world to spend Ramadan with us. And they do nothing but spend Ramadan in our masajid. We don't, we, don't, we don't have them do anything. It's not like, oh, we're invited you, so you have to do a lecture every day, Shaykh. No, they just come, make dua, but we just see them. And we see them for days on end, right? For weeks on end. And, and that's, that's, that's how we learn Ramadan, right? So, yeah. If you're, if, if, you know, no Facebooking, no tweeting, yeah, that's what I'm telling you. I'm telling you to recite the Qur'an. That's what I'm telling everyone to do. Um, hear not that which is prohibited. 
don't listen to anything which is prohibited. This is primarily for young individuals. Most of us listen to a lot of music. And I am no one to tell you that music is haram, but I can definitely tell you that the lyrics of the music, the modern day-to-day -day hip hop that we listen to, that's definitely haram. Right? It's, it's, it is what it is. That which is being described, all the things in your music, that's not allowed. Right? It's definitely questionable. You know, I have a classmate from Burma. Sister Yasmin knows this. Some years ago, through Sister Yasmin actually, I sent him a few hundred dollars. Okay, in Ramadan before, I can't remember anymore. You know, he wrote back to me. He wrote a letter and said, for the entire month of Ramadan, for the entire month of Ramadan, Let alone taste meat, we never even smelled meat for the entire month. We used to have potatoes every day. That's the level of people's poverty. That's the level, if it's making too much noise. I mean, that's the level of people's poverty. We need to be conscious of people's poverty around us. I mean, look at what's happening to Muslims in Syria and Muslims in Burma today. I mean, it's just really, really sad. So don't listen to anything that's, that's not allowed. Don't do anything that's not allowed. Avoid overeating. Someone just told me a few days ago that it takes 15 minutes for the stomach to tell the brain that it's full. Right? How many of you, eat? well, don't, don't. <laughs> I, don't, I really don't want to know. But if you happen to be amongst individuals that eat out fast food, um, look up two, write down these two words. Go home and Google them. Pink slime. You know what pink slime is? Yeah. For those of you that eat out, you should know what pink slime is. And meat glue. Okay, just look up these two terms. You'll stop eating out. And then you wonder why our children are disobedient to their parents in Allah. Meat glue. And then looking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with fear and hope. Imam Ghazali mentions that the third, quali the third grade of fasting is fasting of the heart from all unworthy and worldly concerns. Right? Absolutely no dunya in your life whatsoever. Absolutely no dunya in your life at all. It's nothing but Allah, it's nothing but Allah, and it's nothing but Allah. Okay, that's what it comes down to. So th those are the three gr grades. Uh, generally, we should as individuals try to see if we can fit into at least the second category. Right, at least fit into the second category. Very, very important. Okay, let's move on. The Prophet Sallallahu Ramadan, we all know the Prophet Sallallahu made dua at the beginning of Ramadan, he made dua at the beginning of Sha'ban. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made special, uh, the, the words of the hadith are, he made arrangements to see the moon of the Sha'ban that he did not make for other months. And it's specifically mentioned for Sha'ban and not Ramadan. Because if you have the adad and the count of Sha'ban perfect, then you're bound to have a more perfect adad and count for Ramadan. Right? That's why it's the fasting of Sha'ban, the, sorry, the sighting of the moon of Sha'ban, which was so necessary. And, and we, we do see that. So, so do keep that in mind. When Ramadan would begin, the Prophet ﷺ would make a special dua. The Prophet ﷺ would congratulate the companions. There's no harm in doing that to say Mubarak, Ramadan Mubarak. Send emails, call people, hug, whatever it is that you do. The Prophet ﷺ delivered, there's a very specific hadith, Salman al-Farsi radiallahu anhu narrates this from the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam in which he sallallahu alayhi wasallam mentions that the reward of every nafal and voluntary act is that of a fard. And the reward of every, every fard act is divided by 70. Right? That's why in the month of Ramadan, 
we should endeavor to pray all of our prayers in congregation. We should ensure that we don't omit and miss the sunnah and nafila prayers that are associated to the fard prayers. The sunnah of duhar before and after and the nafil after and the sunnah of asr before and the sunnah of, of maghrib and the nafila of maghrib and the sunnah of isha before and after and so on and so forth. Right? The, the reward is multiplied. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells the companions, companions and says, feed people, feed people. Feed them a meal at the time of breaking the fast. The Sahaba turned to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and says, Ya Rasulullah, we're poor people. We hardly have enough for ourselves. You're telling us to feed people? And so what does the Prophet alayhi salam say? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, if you give them a date, a sip of water, or a sip of milk, Allah will grant you forgiveness. All right, grant you forgiveness. That's why subhanAllah, you know, I, I was, I've mentioned this story so many times, but just a few weeks ago, we got, um, you know, I got a phone call. I've mentioned this a few times. I got a phone call from an individual um, and left me a message and says, Imam Tahir, call me back, it's urgent. Urgent, you know, what's urgent? I call him back and khair, long story short, he decided that he wanted to donate money for the entire fasts for the masjid for the month of Ramadan. I mean, there's people out there people out there who will do that. Uh, they want that reward. They want, and yeah, I get an email a few days later from someone that says, you know, can we buy water for everyone for the month of Ramadan? Can, you know, there's, there's people, there's good people out there. We just, we just have to remind people. That's all there is. Remind them. The reminder benefits the believers, right? There's good people out there. There's a lot of good people out there. And the rewards are, are multiplied. Ramadan is like a, it's like, it's a, it's like a big sale. It's a big, everything's on sale. The rewards are just multiplied and multiplied. And it's just, you can't have enough, right? You can, uh, sometimes I hear women saying that you can never have enough shoes or you can never have enough purses, right? Or whatever, however you define, you can never have enough of whatever, I don't know. For guys, it's like stocks or money or whatever. Uh, you get, that's what it is. In Ramadan, you can never have enough ibadah. It's not like, oh, I've done enough. Today I'm done. Hmm. We'll start tomorrow again. No, it's just, it's never ending. It keeps on going. It's, it's multiplied and multiplied and multiplied. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would, would uh, mention the virtues of fasting. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, the smell, we've been given five, five things that were not granted to any previous nations. Number one, the smell of a fasting person's mouth is more beloved to Allah than the fragrance of musk. The Prophet ﷺ knew that our breaths would stink. Let's be real here. And so the Prophet ﷺ encouraged us and says, Don't worry, I know that. You're hungry, you're going to be hungry. It's going to stink. But know that that smell is more beloved to Allah than the smell of musk. Now, of course, if, you're going to, if you need to go to work, you're going to be in public, you are allowed to brush your teeth. Brushing your teeth with toothpaste does not break your fast as long as it doesn't go inside. In fact, if you're going to be amongst non-Muslims, you're encouraged to brush your teeth and be clean. Right? Um, but if you're not going to be, it's okay to have that smell. Right? It's more beloved to Allah. When Allah loves that coming out of your mouth, why should you stop it? Right? Now, I'm, so be careful. You, know, you, you decide and you judge for yourself how it needs to happen. The Prophet ﷺ says, the fish in the sea keep seeking forgiveness from Allah for the fasting person until iftar. Next Sunday, the, the sea and the fish are going to be made. In fact, the sea and the fish are making to offer us right now. Because the Prophet ﷺ says that whenever someone leaves their home in, in, in pursuit of sacred knowledge, the fish in the sea make du'a for them. So the, sea, the fish in the sea making to offer us right now. And there's a lot of fish in the sea the last time I checked. No, like it's so real. It's so real. Like if we just start... The Prophet ﷺ says that when an individual goes to visit a sick individual, you're in the khurfa of Jannah. You're in a garden of paradise. When you're, and what does, in paradise, whatever we want, we get. So like when we go to visit a sick person, it's a time when we should be making dua. We saw our teachers when they would say like after Asr, because we'd have dars all day. From Asr to Maghrib would be the free time. And so after, before Asr, one of the teachers would call you and say, Bhai Tahir, uh, we have to go and meet someone today after Asr. 
And so, you know, I'd take my car, pull up in front of their house, they'd get in and we'd go and meet that person. And while we would be going, our teachers wouldn't be talking because they're making dua. They would say, literally, I'm in Jannah right now. Why should I be talking? Imagine being a doctor. Imagine being a Muslim doctor. Have the right intention. When you leave for work in the morning, for which you're going to get paid a lot of money that you actually don't deserve, <laughs> you're, you're getting rewards. Like, it's an amazing thing. It's a, deen, Islam is an amazing thing if you only realize. Prophet ﷺ says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes Jannah every day. The devils are chained up in the course of this month and the, um, the ummah is forgiven in the last night. Okay, suhoor. It's a blessed meal. The Prophet ﷺ would make suhoor with dates. The suhoor is the distinction between us and the Ahlul Kitab. <coughs> The, in, in the initial days of Islam, I don't know if I mentioned this, but in the initial days of Islam, there was no such thing as suhoor. You would eat and then you would go to sleep, right? And when you woke up, that was the beginning of your fast. So it was the sleep that was the indicator of the beginning of your fast. And then the verse was revealed, حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَكُمُ الْخَيْطُ الْأَبْيَضُ مِنَ الْخَيْطِ الْأَسْوَدِ مِنَ الْفَجْرِ Right, that's the subh sadiq right there. Right, that the, from the, the white line makes distinction from the black line. Min al khayt al aswadi. Right, and so that, so for us, that was it. And what does the Prophet, in fact, in the ayah of, in the ayahs, in fact, they were mentioned in that first slide. Yuridu Allahu bikum al yusra wa la yuridu bikum al usra. Allah intends ease for you and Allah does not intend difficulty for you. Right? Allah intends ease for you, Allah doesn't, and that's, so suhoor is to make, in fact, the Prophet ﷺ encouraged us to fast. All right, so keep that in mind, it's a sunnah to make suhoor. Also at the same time, I like to tell people, eat healthy, don't eat junk food. It's not a time to eat all this oily food that we normally eat. You know, eat healthy, have a decent suhoor. The other thing is that, you know, it's, we don't, we don't have, you know, people, everyone in the household should come together to prepare for the suhoor. Now, I'm not asking everyone to cook, right? There's some people who can cook and there's others who can't. But those who can't, they can at least set the table. They can do things, right? And then the, the typical male attitude is like they get done, if you're a desi male, right? This is the average like desi male. You get done eating and then you just walk away, right? No, and it's like, oh yeah, I have to pray at the hajjah, then I have to go for fajr, like she doesn't. <laughs> you know, just, just help out in whatever way possible, with the right intention. Clean up the table, put the plates away, take out the garbage. You know, maybe leave the dishes. When the husband wakes up in the morning, maybe he can wash the dishes before he goes. I don't know, whatever. Uh, these are not real rules. Yeah, there's people looking at their, like, uh, like you know, my husband's going to wash the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> but we should honestly we should like whatever we can with the intention of like specific reward yeah, I mean, you know like let me do this despite the fact that I haven't done it for the last 25 years of our marriage but like I, 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 I want some extra reward here okay, so something along those lines I already explained the suhoor right the distinction are you okay is that just a question okay um I explained the suhoor, the adhan of the suhoor, you remember that, right? So, right, the, the adhan, the initial adhan. And by the way, I should have mentioned that some of us have this experience in, in countries where we come from. Prior to the adhan of Fajr, you would have a siren or an announcement or something along those lines. At least where I was, where I lived in India, we'd have this siren, right? In America, we had mom. <laughs> mom would scream at us. Get up, eat. She still does. That's what moms are for. They love you so much. <laughs> My mom, just, she spent, I think, a Ramadan, was it last year, the year before, I can't remember. She would still scream at us. <laughs> and I actually enjoyed it. Honestly, like it reminds you that you're still your mom's kid. No matter, you know, you, you, no matter how old you are, no matter what happens to you, they're still your parents. You know, as my father says, you're still the same kid that I brought home from the hospital 30 some years ago. So don't you go, go on talking about, you know, talking in my face. And so it's a reality. We're children. We will always be our parents' children. And, and it's love. So doing things. But khair, suhoor is a sunnah. We should make suhoor. I already explained the timings of suhoor, you know. 
how, whatever you feel. Whatever you do, don't go past the time. And then don't cheat by having a, a clock in your home that's pushed off by two. Like, <laughs> you, know, you know, let me tell you something, a, a, a very specific stipulation. If you forgetfully eat or drink something, your fast doesn't break. But if you go past the suhoor time eating, you need to make that fast up. There's no forgetful there. So during the course of the day, say it's the first fast, you know, whatever day it is, and your, you know, a friend of yours brings around some steak, you know, filet mignon, and you just, mashallah, you know, you eat the whole thing, you burp a little, and then you say, you know, mashallah, and then you, you write, it's fast, alhamdulillah. That's, a, that's considered a blessing from Allah. No, and so, but if you go, if at the time of suho you have an extra, you know, a uh, spoonful of cereal, you got to do that fast over again. So be very careful. Suhoor is meant to be very, you know, something that we need to think about. During the day, during the course of the day, recite Qur'an, recite Qur'an, and recite Qur'an. This is the month of the Qur'an. If you cannot recite that much Qur'an, listen to the Qur'an. This is a month in which reading holds a precedence. Not the translation of the Qur'an and not the tafsir and explanation of the Qur'an. The translation and the tafsir are reserved for the 11 months. The recitation is what's meant to be done in Ramadan. People say, I can't recite so much. I don't know how to recite. I have a hard time. You know, the Prophet ﷺ was very kind. The Prophet ﷺ says, if you can recite, you get a single reward. If you recite and you do it with difficulty, your reward is doubled. I envy, for, I envy those individuals who can't recite correctly. No, really. Their reward is doubled. Like if you come to think of it. In other words, encouragement from the Prophet ﷺ to recite. Right? Over the years and generations, we've been taught that the Qur'an is meant to be recited. Yes, it's meant to be understood as well. But the reward of recitation in and of itself is an actual act and reward altogether. And one should not underestimate the value of reciting the Qur'an without knowing the translation. Don't ever underestimate the value. And if anyone ever tells you that there's no benefit in reciting the Qur'an without the translation, walk away from them. You don't need people like that in your life. The Qur'an has its own barakah. The, these are, the what is the Qur'an? The Qur'an is the direct word of Allah. We read Shakespeare, we read this spear, we read that spear. We read all kinds of things. And oh my God, this is written by so-and-so. You know, this is Steve Jobs. You know, like, oh my God, we spend all kinds of money. Like, this is Allah. There's Allah. This is your Lord and my Lord. There's a Lord of everything that exists on the face of this earth. This is a Lord of every bright person, every bright man, every bright woman, every, every writer, every poet, every artist that came on the face of this earth. This is their Lord. And that Lord has some things to say to humanity. He had a special message for humanity. And this is that message. And we get to recite it. Words. This is the exact words that Jibreel brought from the heavens to the Prophet And Allah is so kind that He shared this with us. He didn't hide it away somewhere and say, No, 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 this is not for you. Not yet. No, he says, this is all yours. Take it. And Allah was so kind to the Muslim Ummah, inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidhun, that not only did we reveal the Quran, we protected it so that you could recite it. That's the beauty, that's the Quran. Like, you know, it's the direct word of Allah, the God, the God, Allah. The only message that he had for all of humanity, his, his final message, his complete message, we have it unchanged, unadulterated. In fact, if we try hard, we can actually recite it exactly as the Prophet ﷺ recited it. And how he taught individuals to recite it. We have that. And what do we say? There's no benefit in reciting the Qur'an without the translation. Where do we get this? 
right? So be very careful. It's a time to, like I said, recite as much as you can. Carry, you know, most of us carry smartphones these days. Um, the only smartphone is the iPhone. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Uh, we carry we carry smartphones these days. We have apps, images, Quran. We carry a mushaf with you. Historically, people carried masahif with them. Recite, you know. And by the way, it's for many of us. It's not in our culture to recite. It's just not. We we don't recite the Quran. We think like reciting is some big magn magnanimous glorified thing that we have to be all prepared for. I'll give you a simple example from today. Uh, a few uh, we prayed Dhuhr at about one one thirty. Is that what we prayed? One thirty. We prayed Dhuhr at about one twenty ish. Two young men. We have a, we have a large uh, contingent of students from Saudi Arabia who go to San Jose State and other schools here. And two young men walked in. They prayed their Sunnah. There's about three minutes left for Dhuhr. What does the average Desi male do when there's three minutes left for Sunnah? Looks for a flyer or finds someone next to them to talk to them. Right? These individuals, there's three minutes left. Three minutes. Like, what can you get done in three minutes? Both of them, Lord behold, walked up, picked up the Mus'haf and began to recite until the Iqamah was called. We're not, we're not in that habit. Unfortunately, culturally, we don't do that. Right, so we need to get ourselves uh, to, uh, doing that. Um, recite the Quran. You know, you, you, this you, you're just skimming through it. As we normally read books, that's not reciting. Reciting is when you can hear it. It's got to come out of your mouth. Uh, be generous. Give something every day. Give something every day. There, should, there shouldn't be a day that goes by in which we don't give something. Be it a dollar. Be it five dollars. Like in every day. Every day, something to follow that sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and um, not spend all day sleeping. You know, people do things to distract themselves from fasting. D really? There's so much that you're supposed to be doing. How could you like? You know, it's like someone going off on a vacation and saying, "You go and sightsee. I'm going to rest in the hotel, <laughs> and you can come back and tell me all about it." You get the point. It's, there's no. I don't want people to think, oh, I'm going to recite five just daily, ten just daily, whatever you can. But a good portion of our day should go with reciting the Quran. If we if if we just can't recite, if we don't know how to recite the Quran, let's endeavor to learn. And for individuals of that of those kind, let's read the translation. Allah will reward us. Allah is very kind. Don't underestimate the mercy of Allah. Don't underestimate the kindness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Iftar. The Prophet ﷺ did iftar after sunset. Immediately after sunset. He didn't wait. So as soon as it was sunset, the adhan would begin to be called and the Prophet ﷺ would break his fast. Iftar here means breaking the fast and not dinner. The sunnah of Nabi ﷺ was to very briefly break his fast, pray maghrib and then go for dinner. You know like, the Prophet's iftar was dates. That's the sunnah. Right? Um, it's just subhanallah. He did iftar with the poor, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He did iftar with the poor. Right? Uh, he did iftar before salat, not maghrib as in the time for maghrib, as in before salat al maghrib. So it was adhan. And, and it's, it's correct, it's perfectly permissible and correct to make iftar while the adhan is being called. You don't have to wait for the adhan to complete. Right? And then there's the hadith. لِلصَّائِمِ عِنْدَ فِطْرِهِ دَعْوَةٌ مُسْتَجَابَةٌ For the fasting individual at the time of iftar is an accepted dua. The time of iftar historically has been a time of dua. I have seen in my life certain times of dua for my teachers. The wee hours of the morning on a regular basis before Fajr. The time between the sunnah and the fard prayers. That's a moment of acceptance on any given day. Once the sunnah prayer is complete, be it fajr, dhuhr, whatever, and the fard prayer, whatever time is in between, that's a moment of acceptance. I would see, historically, I have seen the masjids filled before Salatul Maghrib on Friday, the wee hours of Yawm al Um... The, the time between the two khutbahs and the time of iftar. 
of all the teachers that I have studied with and spent time with, I don't ever recall any of them doing anything but two things between Asr and Maghrib in Ramadan. Quran and Dua. There was no third. There's absolutely no. It was Quran or Dua, one of the two. And the times closer to Salat al-Maghrib were a time for Dua. And so I like to mention, and I mention this usually when we do my Hajj workshop, make a list of Dua's. Make a list of all the Dua's that you want to make for yourself, for your children, for your family, for your friends. Make a list. Right? And utilize that list when you're making Dua. And have that list with you. Have it on your phone, have it on your email, have it on your laptop. It should be with you wherever you are, wherever you go. That whenever you have a moment to make Dua, you can open that list and you don't forget things that you want to ask Allah for. You can utilize that list. So make a list of du'as. The time, for, the time of Maghrib on Friday is a very, very sacred time. Iftar parties. Iftar parties are contrary to Sunnah. <laughs> if there was a, a correct iftar party, it would be simple and quick. Our iftar parties are lengthy. We do nothing but waste time. Right? It takes the women an hour and a half to get ready to go to the party. And it takes the men two hours. They say that we pick on the women all the time. So we pick on the men this time. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The amount of makeup and the clothes. And we have to get ready because we're going to a party. And then the 25, 30 minutes to get there. Taking two cars because the husband's going to go to the masjid and the wife's going to go back home. Right? Getting there, looking for parking, walking in, time of iftar, people talking. No ibadah, no Qur'an, no dua, nothing. Then there's this lavish iftar that takes 20 minutes in which you could have had done your iftar, prayed maghrib, and even had half of your dinner, to be honest with you. Right? Lavish iftar. Then someone leads maghrib. Then the dinner is finally gets served. And then you have to eat dinner. And then you run to the masjid. Race to the masjid. Park wrong. Block someone off. Run a red light. Burp next to the imam in prayer. Let him figure out what you had for dinner. We, we, we like to prepare for our guests. But in all honesty, we go out of our way to prepare for them. To some extent, where is it's israf, we're wasting. Right? In Islam, we're encouraged to invite people. To the extent where the ulama mentioned that the dinner that we serve to people should generally be simple. Why? So you can invite people more regularly. But to the contrary, our parties are so grand and there's such a standard that's set that we don't invite people as often as we normally should. Right? So, wasting food, du'as are not made, late to the masjid. I tell people, you want the reward of an iftar, go to your local masjid. There's a chart right there behind you, sign up for iftar. A hundred people, amongst them we have homeless people, we have new Muslims, we have single brothers, I mean we have, we have single sisters, I mean we have all kinds of people that make iftar with us daily. Now, I'm not asking everyone to be at the masjid for iftar, but I'm asking that wherever you are, you're with Allah. You're with Allah. It's a time. لِلصَّائِمِ عِنْدَ فِطْرِهِ دَعْوَةٌ مُسْتَجَابَةٌ For the sa'im at the time of iftar is an accepted dua. And according to one hadith, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that a hundred thousand people are forgiven at iftar daily. And on the last day, on the last iftar, when we're all hustling, bustling and getting ready for Eid, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives the number of individuals that He forgave during the entire month of Ramadan. Amongst the nights of worship, the, the, the night of Eid is actually a night of worship. Right? It's not a night of dressing up and getting ready and pulling out your iPods because you haven't listened to music for the whole month. The day of Eid, by the way, is a day of worship. It's not a day where like, oh my God, bas khatam. Shaitan, come on, I've been waiting for you. Where have you been, yaar? <laughs> Taraweeh is the sunnah of Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is in its current form from the time of Umar radiallahu an. Need, you need to understand that a little. Islamic law in Islam, sharia, comes from one of four things. Quran, sunnah, ijma', consensus. And the highest level of consensus happens to be the consensus of the sahaba. Because once the Prophet passed away, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it was the Sahaba. So that's the highest level of consensus. Then it was the consensus of the Tabi'een. Then it was the consensus of the Tabi'een. Then it's been the consensus of the Ulama afterwards. 
Right? Then it was the consensus of the fiqh scholars, the consensus of the hadith scholars, and so on and so forth. This can be divided. But if it's a consensus of ulama, it can be law in Islam. It's part of sharia. And then there's analogy, fayas. Umar radiallahu anhu instated salatul taraweeh in the form of 20 rak'ahs and none of the sahaba dissented. It's a law. For almost 1300 years, taraweeh was 20. There was no such thing as 8. It was only some hundred and some years ago that a certain individual decided that it was going to be 8. But pick up any literature in Islam, any, any historical literature, and you won't find 8 anywhere. Up until 1300s, it was always 20. It was never 8. It just wasn't. Then, of course, there, this, is a, this is a major argument altogether. We're not going to go into this. But there's, there's, then there's the question of, you know, where do you get 8? And then the hadith that the Pro Aisha radiallahu anha has hadith that the Prophet alayhi salam prayed 8 in Ramadan and no more than 8 in Ramadan. That was specifically referring to tahajjud. That was not taraweeh. And there's so many ahadith to back this up and prove this. Now, it may not be possible for everyone to pray 20. Pray whatever you can pray, knowing that the correct number is 20. So if you're not able, to, and it's a sunnah, so it's not required, but it is a sunnah mu'akkadah. The Prophet ﷺ, you know, he encouraged and the Sahaba after that prayed. Um, but if you're not able to pray all 20, whatever you pray, say Alhamdulillah and say, Ya Allah, grant me the strength to do more. Don't be content and say, Ah, I've done four today. Ma'am, I'm done. Tarawih. It's just a sunnah. No. Say, Allah, I've done four. I wish I could do more, but I can't. I need to go to work. And let me tell you, please rest in Ramadan as well. Get enough rest. There's a Muslim brother from our own community. His family is part of our community. He was driving home from work last year and he got into a, he fell asleep and his entire car flipped over on 101. Right? This is someone that we, they didn't make it very public, but we know the family, most of us probably know the family. Right? The entire car flipped over. Alhamdulillah, he didn't get hurt. Um, but that's a reality. He fell asleep at, coming home from work. So, you know, rest as well. So make, do whatever you need to. As far as how many rak'ahs, stop arguing with people how many rak'ahs it is. Do as much as you can. If anything, at least come to the masjid for Isha. That's a given. There's no excuse. The Prophet ﷺ says that if I had my way, I would not pray in congregation and I would go to the houses of the men who haven't attended the congregational prayer and burn their homes. And the Prophet ﷺ says that if, the, if men knew what the reward was for attending the masjid for congregational prayer, they would crawl there if they had to. So come to the masjid for at least Isha. And then if someone decides to leave after Isha, don't give them the look. No, let's... Let's make this, let's make a pact amongst all of ourselves that we won't give anyone the look if they leave early. And we will never bring it up to them afterwards either. Oh, you left after Isha, I saw you. No, none of that. Alhamdulillah. Let's encourage. It's the one that will come for Isha who will pray two taraweeh. It's the one who will pray two that will turn into four. And the one that will pray four that will turn into eight. And the one that will pray eight. But the one who never shows up is not going to get there. We need to give them room. We need to. So at least. And the Prophet ﷺ says, pray Isha in congregation, you get the reward of worshipping Allah half of the night. Pray Fajr in congregation, you get the reward of praying, uh, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for half of the night. So that's a given. And if you're not going to pray all the rak'ahs and you're going to leave, don't be standing outside the masjid, masjid parking lot talking. I've never understood that. You're telling me that your talking is more important than the prayer? Like really? Just, it, you know, if you really have to talk, some people like to talk. Um, you have five days, just talk. Get it out of your system. Or store it somewhere, and then do it after Ramadan. Like, I, you know, if someone goes home and goes to sleep, I understand. They're tired, got to go to work, make suhoor. But someone stand outside in the parking lot just talking away, so that just goes to show how difficult it is for us to worship Allah. Our hearts are just not ready. It's so difficult. Right, so we need to be conscious of this. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the, 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 the text is very small. I, I actually just I combined two slides. The, the last 10 days of Ramadan, the Prophet ﷺ made a'tikaf. Being secluded is not allowed in Islam. 
being secluded is not, but the month of Ramadan is a month in which the Prophet ﷺ allows seclusion. Just one thing of, for clarification, the sunnah, mu'akkadah, i'tikaf of Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam was the last full 10 days and nights of Ramadan. Nafal i'tikaf, a voluntary i'tikaf can be done at any time. It could be from one second to a hundred days. When you walked into the masjid right now, you could have easily made the intention for i'tikaf and gotten the reward and you'd be in i'tikaf right now. There are no rules for a voluntary i'tikaf. For a sunnah mu'akkada i'tikaf, you have to be secluded. In other words, no talking, no gossiping, no phones, no laptops. That's the sunnah mu'akkada i'tikaf. That's the only way that that shart will be complete. According to some ulama, eating inside the masjid la yajuz is not allowed. The only reason, why, that's why when people eat in the masjid, I start getting all edgy. Eating is not allowed in the masjid. Right? The only people that are allowed to eat in the masjid are the mu'takifin. That's what the books of fiqh mention. Think about it. You know, Imam Zaid some years ago did i'tikaf with us. Ten, ten days. You know, he never talked to anyone. I noticed. He had a big tent in the back. Never talked to anyone. And for ten days, he drank water and ate dates. That was it. That was his meal. Right? And, and despite the fact that there's such a great reward of sitting in the first row because he knew people knew him, he would sit inside his tent until the iqama would be called. As soon as the iqama would be called, he'd hear a zip and he would walk out and wherever he found space, he prayed Aisha and Taraweeh. And as soon as he was done, he would run back in and zip up his tent. And when people had left, he'd come out and sit on the sofa and recite the Qur'an. Yeah. Now, if, if we can spend the night, I'm not saying don't go to the masjid for i'tikaf. But if you want to do the sunnah mu'akkada i'tikaf of the Prophet ﷺ, there's a specific method and way of doing it. Otherwise, you can go to the masjid, you can take your laptops, you can go to work in the morning, all encouraged because it's all good. But the sunnah i'tikaf, the sunnah i'tikaf is so strict, the sunnah i'tikaf is so strict that you can't even go into another area of the masjid in which there's no need for you to be there. You only have to be in the prayer area. It's, it's seclusion. Right. We should at least, at least endeavor to do it once. The, the men do the i'tikaf at the, at the masjid. It's not allowed for women to do i'tikaf at the masjid. It's not allowed. Women do i'tikaf in their homes. They could, it could be a room. Uh, whatever they decide that this is going to be my... It doesn't have to be a corner. Okay, it doesn't have to be like a corner. The s no, it could be under the stairs, yeah. It could, it could be a room. It could be an entire room. That's your place of etika. And because uh, uh, you have certain responsibilities, household responsibilities that you need to fulfill, such as cooking, cleaning, you're allowed to do that. Now, if the husband was nice enough and he catered for 10 days, that would be nice. Although, I, I don't know if I could eat catered food for 10 days. Um, the Prophet ﷺ would increase his effort. He would do more. Specifically mentioned that he would awaken his family and he would seek the night of Qadr. I'll mention one thing and we'll move on to the next slide. We're almost to the end. If someone does the Sunnah Mu'akkada I'tikaf of the Prophet ﷺ with all its conditions, the moment you walk into the masjid on the eve of the 20th of Ramadan, when the 21st is about to begin at the time of Maghrib, you begin, you enter into a state of worship. Which means that when you leave after 10 days or 9 days, you will have the reward of the night of Qadr. Because you have entered in a, into, the moment you entered into I'tikaf, you've entered into a state of Ibadah. Okay, so keep that in mind, if that encourages anyone. Zakah, I could spend forever on this. The fiscal year for zakah is the lunar year, not the Gregorian year. It's not 1st January to 1st January. Most people like to make their year to be Ramadan. And there's a method of doing this. You have to be a sahibun nisab, you have to give your zakah and move the year over. If you want to study zakah, we can do that at some other time. We don't have time. Ideally, calcul and calculate your zakah. Don't just randomly give zakah. I know so, I've been here for a number of years now, alhamdulillah. I know so many people, women, who haven't given zakah on their jewelry ever. In fact, the last time I mentioned this, 
at a workshop not too long ago, I got an email from someone that said, Imam Tahir, I happen to be one of those individuals who've never given their zakah on their jewelry. And then you wonder why all the barakah is gone from our lives. Yamhaqullahu riba wa yurbi sadaqat. It's the sadaqah that increases one's wealth, despite the fact that it's zakah that's going away. I, I used to have a teacher. He wouldn't, you know, we had a relative who was poor, who was liable to receive, could, uh, could receive zakah. But he wouldn't allow for that relative to take zakah. Because at the end of the day, it was the filth of someone else's money. This is, this is your wealth. The bar of gold, I wish. Um, this is your wealth. As soon as the year ends, you have to give 2.5% away. 1 40th. So you divide this into 40, you take one portion, give it away. Has your wealth increased or decreased? Depends on how you look at it, right? And that portion, for as long as it's in your wealth, it's haram, it's filth, and it contaminates everything else. It's filth for the giver, it's not filth for the receiver. But there are certain individuals, I've come across individuals in my life who are extremely poor, who are liable to receive zakah, but they will not take zakah from you because they don't want to touch someone else's filth. I will do with the little that I have, but I don't want anything else. I've come across a lot of people. By the way, the giver does not have to tell the receiver that it's zakah. But if you have doubts about the receiver that they may have gold stored away, then you must inquire and ask, can you receive zakah? Despite that, let me tell you, I have been, like, I've gone to people with zakah because I personally like to give my own zakah. I don't like to give it to organizations. I like to give my own zakah. When you give your own zakah, I've had people tell me, if this is zakah, like they're poor, I mean their clothes are tattered, you know what I'm saying? Like, as soon as you give it to them, they'll say, is this zakah? And you'll say, yes it is. And they'll say, I don't accept zakah. But what we were taught from our teachers, and this is going a level beyond that, that if it is zakah, immediately change your intention and make it into a voluntary charity and say no and give it to them. That's your test from Allah. So say I have $500, I need to get, I'm going to give it to someone. brother. Here's $500. I don't need to tell them it's zakah. I just can give it to them. If that brother asks me and says, is this zakah? And if in my mind, I have a feeling that they're going to say, I don't want zakah or I can't receive zakah, I could simply immediately, within a millisecond, change my intention and say, no, it's not, and give it to them. But that means I still have to give my zakah then. That 500 I gave away is volunteer charity. Now I still need to give another 500 zakah. So you need to have a little bit of a heart to do that. You don't have to give your zakah immediately. You calculate your zakah, say it's $5,000, you have to give zakah. You don't have to give it immediately. At least separate it from your wealth. Put it in a different account, put it in an envelope, whatever. And then utilize that to give for the rest of the year. You can do that. Say all the zakah that you calculated last year, you've, de you've been depleted. And someone comes to you and says, brother, sister, I need, I, I need some money. You can give zakah in advance. Zakah can be given as long as the intention is made. So say you gave $5,000 in advance, Ramadan comes around, you calculate, you have to give 7000 You deduct 5000 because you already gave it and now you only have to give 2000 Like I said, you don't have to give it immediately. You can keep it aside and then utilize from there to give. But take it out, mark it, put it away. You may die. The haram will be in your wealth. Very particular. Zakah needs to be given every year on jewelry, on 401ks. Zakah must be given. Every year on 401ks. Yeah, if, and if you haven't, then know that you're never going to have a 401k. It's going to go down very fast, very hard. Um, give to the poor and needy. Uh, masjid operation and construction funds do not qualify for zakah. 99.9% .9 of Muslim scholars do not allow for zakah to qualify as construction and operation funds. Because we live in a community where everything wants to be relaxed and laxed and easy and easy brother, easy brother. You know, we find that 0.1% and say it's permissible. It's not. I don't follow that. And at our, at our masjid, alhamdulillah, I say this with thanks to Allah, we never utilize zakah funds at this masjid for masjid operations or construction. 100% of what comes to this masjid from the rich goes to the poor. 
And going back to, I know my time is running out, I apologize. Zakat al-Fitr, Sadaqat al-Fitr. Why do you give Sadaqat al-Fitr at Eid? The Prophet ﷺ says give it before Eid. Ideally give it a few days before Eid. There's two reasons for it. One, one reason is so that if there was any deficiency in your fast, it will make up for the deficiency. The second reason is so that poor people can celebrate Eid as well. That's why don't wait till the last minute to give your sadaqah. Give it a few days in advance. <clears throat> Next to last slide, make a schedule. I mentioned earlier, don't go to the mall in Ramadan. I'm not telling you to not go shopping. You have tonight, after you leave from here, you have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and for some Friday, um, go shopping. Go to Costco, go wherever you need to, shop for the entire month. My wife knows that in Ramadan, I will buy no more than four things. Milk, bread, eggs, and yogurt. If there's a fifth thing on the list, I'm not going to buy it. I just don't. Whatever, and she, and by the way, I'm going to be married for a number of years. Make God that we remain together. I mean, inshallah. Um, uh, but you know, when I came home this morning, Lord behold, right next to all my stuff was these lists, shopping lists. She's like, this is what you need to get. Right? She knows. When Allah comes, this man ain't going out and get nothing. He'll make us live hungry if we have to. Or survive on the all, right? But he ain't got nothing. Um, just, it's, it's the way I was raised, it's the way I was trained. Malls and shopping were not how I was trained. I did not see malls and shopping growing up in Ramadan. Right? We were dedicated. We had things to do. And if, if we didn't have anything to do, we still wouldn't be out in the marketplace because of the number of reasons that Imam Ghazali mentioned. See not, hear not, do not. So I'm not saying don't. And spend, go. Spend. I don't care. You have hundreds of hundreds of thousands of dollars, go spend. It's okay. Right? But Ramadan is not a time for that. Take time off from work. Use your vacation time. Vacation time is not just for vacations. Vacation time is for Fridays in Ramadan. You know, subhanAllah, the first, the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says on any Friday, the first person to come to the masjid gets the reward of sacrificing the camel. We have a young lawyer, years on end now, alhamdulillah, he's usually the first person to arrive on Friday at this masjid. And mind you, he's a lawyer. So he could be sitting in his office, writing up a few emails and charging tons of money. So it's not like he has nothing to do. But his heart is in the right place. May Allah put our hearts in the right place as well. I take Friday off if you can. Come early. Come early. You know, uh, last 10 nights of Ramadan, if you can take a few nights off, take them off. Not, pray, like I mentioned, pray for the prayers at the masjid. Attend Taraweeh. Carry Quran with you. And when the month of Shawwal comes, fast the sixth of Shawwal. One last thing I'm going to mention, then I'm going to end. For people who have missed fasts in Ramadan, you miss fast for whatever reason, ill traveling, whatever it was. You cannot in the month of Shawwal combine intentions. So you cannot say this is sh sh the first of Shawwal and my first mist of Ramadan. The second of Shawwal and the second mist of Ramadan. Because with any fard act, you cannot combine intentions. And if you're going to make up a fard, you're making up the fard, you're not doing the fast of Shawwal. Though the ulama have mentioned that if you end up doing six in Shawwal of the fard that you might have missed, you'll inshallah get the reward. But you can't combine intentions. It's not like you can do one prayer and say this is Dhuhr and Asr in one. You can't do that. You can't combine. You can't say that this is the four Sunnah of Dhuhr and the four Fard of Dhuhr in one shot. That's, I'm just giving you a real example. It's to, to make, you don't do that. It doesn't happen. Same thing with uh, fasting. You can't, you can't do that. Khair, inshallah, we pray that this Ramadan happens to be a blessed one for us. I have a lot of questions. I'm going to try to get. Actually, I don't have a lot of questions, to be honest with you. These questions are like What is the etiquette of dua for acceptance? There is a, um, there's a book called Reflections of Pearls. And there's a book called Dua, Weapon of a Believer. Buy any one of those two and you'll learn the etiquette. I, the etiquette of dua, being in a state of wudu, praying salah, being in the masjid, facing the qibla, and so on and so forth. Imam Ghazali, Imam Ghazali gets very specific. He tells you to make ghusl. So there's no impurities on your body whatsoever. He tells you to wash your clothes and then wear them. So there's absolutely no impurity on your clothes. And then he tells you to not pray two rakahs, he tells you to pray four rakahs. And then he says, make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. Um, begin with Arabic supplication and then go to English. Uh, begin with the praise of Allah as much as you can. Salutations on the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yes, as much Arabic as you can. And then go to whatever language you're comfortable in. Is it true that we can't take a shower after Dhuhr during Ramadan when fasting? No, it's not. I thought it is good to praise your children and grandchildren, if not done for personal conceit. If one is in the process of eating when the time ends for eating, can we finish the food on plate before stop eating? If the time ends, no, you can't. Start early. In most third world countries, the price of wheat is, say, net $6, but $3. So do you send $3 if you're sending home? Most people ask this. I recommend the $6, but I want to know. You, you send based on where you're living, not based on where you're giving. When women, when women miss fasts due to their time of the month, how do they make it up? Uh, one kafara per menses or day? No, no, no. It's just, just one day for the day that you miss. There's no kafara. You have a, that's a, uh, if you're menstruating, that's a valid reason to not fast. So there's no kafara there. It's just, it's just one fast that you missed. And whatever number of fasts that you missed, you don't have to make them up consecutively. You can make them up one this month, one next year. I don't know, whenever you feel like it. So the question is, can one go to the movie theater during Ramadan? Although it should be phrased, it should be phrased and said, can one see the dark night? <laughs> you know, I'll, after having been here for the last three hours, I'll let you answer that one. <laughs> can blood and dental work be performed while fasting? Blood work, if you're extracting blood, yes. Dental work, no, because you're bound to swallow something. Uh, meningitis shots. Can you take meningitis shots for those of you that are going for Hajj? Yes, you can. Meningitis shots will not break your fast. Last 10 days of seclusion. If you have a roommate, can you speak when needed? Yes, you can speak when needed. No, no, no. I mean, you can speak. But, you know, the idea is... 
what is the right way of joining Taraweeh if you arrive late for Isha? So you complete your Isha first and then you join Taraweeh. And if you miss, say for example, two rak'ahs of Taraweeh, then when the Imam completes his 20, then you will pray too. Or if you fear that you're going to miss Witr, then you pray the Witr and then you pray Taraweeh afterwards. Because that's still permissible. By the way, oh yaar, the whole Witr stipulation. So at 5, if you want to leave, you can leave, but I'm probably going to go till about 5.10 with the number of questions that I have here. <coughs> the whole wither is a problematic issue in Ramadan. Ramadan is the only time when wither is prayed in congregation, so it should be prayed in congregation. You understand that much? Yes. Ramadan is the only time when wither is prayed in congregation, so you should pray in congregation. Also, if you've already prayed with her in congregation after Taraweeh, you are still allowed to pray Tahajjud in the morning. Because sometimes you hear people saying that once you've prayed your with her, you can't pray anything else. There's an explanation that this deserves. And that is that the Prophet Wasallam's last prayer of the day happened to be with her. So on a regular day, he would wake up in the morning, pray Tahajjud, make with her, and then pray Salatul Fajr. Okay, that's how it was. But because in the month of Ramadan we pray wither in congregation, wither is preferred in congregation. But this doesn't mean that now all night you don't have you can't pray anything. No, you can pray. So if someone tells you that you can't pray after wither, just walk away from them. No, I'm just I'm, th there's a lot of length, there's a lot of detail that goes into this, the hadith and the practice and so on and so forth. We don't have time to go into it. Must one make up the fard fasts of Ramadan before one fasts the six days of Shawwal? You don't have to, there's no rule. But you should try to get done the faridah first before the sunnah. Suppose you die, you never know. What about three nights of i'tikaf? Is it okay? Is it okay? Yes, it's a nafil i'tikaf. Three nights, three minutes is better than nothing. Is the kafara two lunar months or 60 days? 60 days. Yeah, six, no, no, specifically mentioned. Is there evidence of the Prophet ﷺ breaking the nafal fast when offered a meal? Uh, a meal. Uh, when offered meal. I, I don't know. I don't know if there is. Can one fast a... Nafal fast with the intention of qada, one of three fast of the month. Can one fast, a single fast, but with the, you can't combine intentions, we already went through that. Now if you fast, say if you fast on a Monday, you can anticipate reward of that Monday fast from Allah, but you can't combine intentions and say, this is my sunnah fast of Monday and the fourth fast that I missed in Ramadan. Is fidya only for dependent members of the family? Yes, but all of them. So say a child was born on the morning of Eid, you must give fidya on their behalf. But say someone died right before Fajr on Eid, you don't have to give a fidya on their behalf. Hi, it is my first time to the masjid. Welcome. I have never fasted before but started to do it. When actually fasting begins and where can one get the time schedule? There's many time schedules on the table here and in the back. Uh, the timings are on there. May Allah make it easy for you. Amin. And may Allah accept it from you. Amin. For the one who calls the Adhan, when does he break his fast? The person who calls the Adhan cannot break their fast. They have to wait until Isha to break their fast. <laughs> I don't know, maybe before, after. <laughs> Fahim, when do you break your fast? After? You, Rashid Bhai, you do it after? After? Okay, I guess it's after. The Mu'addins of our masjid have told you it's after. How do you get on the zakat poor needy list? There's no list. Oh, by, so there's a threshold. Right? I mean, I guess if, at our masjid you can apply for, an, you have an application, there's an application process. But there's a threshold depending on how much gold or silver you have, right? And if you reach that threshold in terms of your assets, you're now liable to give zakah. 
And if you don't have the cash to give zakah, you have to cash out from those assets to give zakah. So my dear sisters, you have to sell that one earring and break your set if you must. And your husbands don't have to give zakah on your behalf if that gold is yours. If he does, thank him. But he doesn't have to. No, let's be real here. It's your money. If it's your wealth, you give your zakah. And if that means that mera set to jayega imam sahab. Ek earring chali jayega. Set goes, set goes, zakah comes first. You give that one earring, Allah will give you 70. Yeah. Uh, an iPhone is not a zakatable asset. <laughs> Men in Islam don't have jewelry. Question, local versus abroad, prefer local or abroad, whatever suits your heart. If one perf oh, I love this one. Oh, yeah. This is I, I. You have to get this one. If one has performed Hajj, you want to finish the question now? Does it mean there's no need to make up the post Hajj missed fasting? No, 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 no. A farida is a farida that you owe, owe to Allah Subhanahu. If if you've done anything wrong, Allah forgives that. You start over. But a farida that you owe to Allah, you owe to Allah. So if you miss, if you owe an X amount of fard prayers to Allah, you owe those. Just because you pray in the haram once and you get the reward of a hundred thousand, doesn't mean that a hundred thousand, you've been relieved of a hundred thousand prayers. You got the reward of a hundred thousand prayers, but you still haven't been relieved. But at the end of the day, do bear in mind, that's Allah. Allah can forgive. Don't ever harm an individual because al ibad, they will stand on the day, on the day of judgment, Allah. Allah may come to you and say, listen, you know, you've been good. All this with, move, chalo. You know, but if it's hukuk al ibad, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam clearly mentions that you will come to Allah on the day. It's a hadith, Sahih hadith. You come to Allah on the day of judgment with a with a heap of rewards, right? And you've you've shatama hada, akala mala hada, safaka dama hada. It's a long hadith that you've hurt this individual, you've cursed this individual, you've taken wealth away from this individual, you've backbit this individual, and they will continue to take from your deeds until you will have no good deeds left to give. But you'll still have people standing in line whom you owe. And then you start taking their bad deeds. So eventually, although, that's why one should never be proud about their good deeds. Like, oh, I'm a very pious person, I do a lot of good. We, will, we must do as much good as we can, but ultimately we will only enter paradise by the fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah is very merciful and we will all, inshaAllah, enter Jannah. Ameen. Is it of notably greater value to recite the Qur'an with the goal of finishing as much as possible than to memorize during Ramadan? Whatever you feel comfortable with, as, much, as long as you're reciting. How about selling food in masjid? Do we have to sell extra food to make money? I mean, otherwise people abuse it and so on and so forth. There's no harm in selling the food. We don't, it's not like we make a lot of money, we pay for it. If a woman enters her menses during kafara, does she add days to reach the 60 total fasts? Yes. So she subtracts, you know, she starts, she's done 20, and then she misses 5, so she's done 20 now. Once those 5 are over, then she starts fast 21 and goes on and completes that. So basically, her 60 days will probably take maybe 80 days to complete, for example. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika, nashadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may He subhanahu wa ta'ala make this month a blessed one for us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the strength, the ability, the tawfiq to worship Him as much as we can. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may this Ramadan be better than other previous Ramadans. And may we, may we all become close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And may Allah facilitate and make it easy for us to do the direct acts of worship. And may we not get tired by worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may He accept our fasting in Ramadan and our dua. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta samia al-alim wa tab alayna innaka anta tawab al-rahim. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salaman ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. We've all been in this journey together. Let us ensure that we, uh, inshallah, I will make dua for you and in, in return I anticipate that you make dua for us.